Welcome. My name is Michelle Deutschman. I'm the executive director at the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. And I wanna welcome you to the launch of our Speech Spotlight Live series. Speech Spotlight Live will occur monthly and will focus on the pressing topics of expression and civic engagement in higher education. Today, to kick off our series, we are privileged to be in conversation with the leader of the greatest public education institution in the country, some might say in the world, UC President Michael Drake, of course, as a Berkeley grad, go Bears, I am not totally objective. This past August, Michael V. Drake became the 21st president of UC's system of 10 campuses, five medical centers, three nationally affiliated labs, more than 280,000 students and 230,000 faculty and staff. Dr. Drake previously served as the president of the Ohio State University, OSU, from 2014 through June 2020. Prior to his six years at OSU, his entire academic career has been at UC, including as chancellor of UC Irvine for nine years from 2005 to 2014, and as the system-wide vice president for health affairs from 2000 to 2005. President Drake received his AB from Stanford University and his residency MD and fellowship in ophthalmology from UCSF. He subsequently spent more than two decades on the faculty of the UCSF School of Medicine, including as the Stephen P. Shearing Professor of Ophthalmology. And last but not least, I'm especially proud of the fact that President Drake is the chair of the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. President Drake, thank you for taking the time to join us today. There's so much to discuss, so I think we should just jump right in. Very good to see you. Happy to be here. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so I think it would be an understatement to say that the last month has a, been a kind of a tumultuous one in the civic life of our nation. And I, I'm curious what struck you um, about the historic events that we witnessed, you know, as a leader, as an educator, as a grandfather, sort of what disturbs you and maybe what gives you hope? Yeah, you know, the things that it was quite a month, I mean, the first week um, of, the, of the year, we, we were all looking... <laughs> Well, I don't, we were all speaking for other people. I was looking forward to a new year. You know, 2020 has been such a, um, a devastatingly harsh year for us here in this country and, and around the world. And so kind of the idea of getting to a new year, getting through the pandemic, getting back to more normal human life was something we were looking forward to. And then we uh, cross into the new year and in the first week we have the, the really awful events uh, that took place in, in Washington. And, um, and I, I think as I, I know that as we look back on them, there are many things that one uh, expected. There were things that were suggested for months and months and months, um, naive, I guess, and hopeful. I never thought those things would come to fruition. I thought there was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, noise. And, uh, and then to sort of watch it all unfold um, uh, was uh, really uh, surreal and, and, uh, and really tragic. And, um, you know, as we've said, and many of, of us have said that, that, that with all of the turmoil and strife and disagreements that we have, one thing that the country has had for, you know, uh, more than 240 years is this ability to have a peaceful transfer of power. So I thought that would at least be something we'd be able to do. And that was the problems like that were things that we saw on TV happening elsewhere. You know, we would send people to help them not do that because that was elsewhere. So it was uh, uh, really shocking to have it uh, uh, happened here. So that was, um, again, surreal as it, as it unfolded um, uh, first. Let me say, though, if we uh, fast forward two weeks later, uh, I uh, was, um, uh, I've had the privilege, as, as I, I know others have, to be at uh, an inauguration in person in the past and uh, watched over all these years. I just thought that the, the focus on those things that are the ideals that we really do set forward as a country, the, the ideals that the country was founded on, the stepping forward into the future that the inauguration represented, that was, I thought, quite hopeful with two particularly special parts, uh, just for me uh, personally. First, um, the, the swearing of the, the vice president, um, Kamala Harris, um, hard, you know, just in thinking about that, it, this is in all of our history, first woman to be elected to national office uh, all of those you know uh, um, more than two centuries so what a what a, a change that is you know that so that's something that's long overdue first I mean, and for the vice president the 
course, African American, uh, Asian American, uh, uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, so, so really, an, an historic moment, and so the terrific, and to have it be an alumna and someone who we uh, know. I mean, that that was uh, uh, touching. So that was uh, an interesting milestone. And then also, I was very struck by, um, you know, Ms. Gorman was referred to as the youth poet laureate. You know, I think just to take the youth away, I mean, what an, I thought that was such a touching, connected, stirring, um, historical, future looking, hopeful uh, uh, rendition or poem. And I'm, I'm old, so I remember sort of the grainy uh, black and white images of Robert Frost speaking at John Kennedy's inauguration many years ago. And so growing up, I had to memorize Robert Frost poems. So I thought it was a really special thing to have a that kind of a person there doing that. And seeing this now 60 years later with a, uh, a real different generation, a different focus, an entirely different, uh, a person at an entirely different place in her career than the elderly Robert Frost was at the time. That, that also I thought was, very hopeful for the future. Longer answer than I mentioned, but I was, it was really quite a, uh, it was quite energetic, um, quite intense um, uh, first few weeks here. Absolutely. And I, I am going to admit that um, in the last couple of weeks when I have been feeling a little bit low, um, I just play myself that poem by Amanda Gorman. I find it incredibly beautiful and inspirational. Um, I've made my kids listen to it um, more than once, which I'm not sure that they love. But, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned kind of history and you've lived through and taught about other tumultuous times in our history, in particular, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. For a time, you taught with Erwin Chemerinsky, who's now the Dean of Berkeley Law, um, about that movement. And I'm wondering if you could share some thoughts about what feels different about you know the movement then and now and activism then and activism today. Well, great. Yeah, I, I did teach um, <clears throat> for six years with uh, uh, Dean Chemerinsky, and then I taught. And when I was that was when I was at Irvine, at, and and then at Ohio State, I taught with the dean of the law school there. This uh, similar iterations of the course, which looked at the civil rights era and the critical thinking. What how would you have responded during those times? So we we actually had the the experience of the student. This was a freshman seminar, so the students were 18, 19 years old, and we used these events in the past. But we asked them to kind of put themselves in the places of the people who lived through them, to hear how to to discuss them and to uh, think through the things that were were happening. Uh, and and it was always done, it turned out we didn't, I didn't know this would happen, didn't expect it, but it was always done in reference to the outside world and the outside world changed so much during the years we were teaching. So we had um, Arab Spring, we had the election of Barack Obama, we had uh, Ferguson in Missouri, we had the election of Donald Trump. So there were big issues happening in the world that uh, were relevant to uh, human rights and civil rights and uh, social uh, justice and, and equity. And so it was interesting that we would look at things that happened in the 1950s and 60s and then discuss them in, in terms that were relevant to what was happening in, in the newspapers and, and in our, our own cities today. What I would say is this, the, the back, there's sort of, sort of things that were similar and things that are different in, in when we looked at the, the two eras. So one thing back then is that young people were extraordinarily active in the movement and colleges and college students were active in the movement. Um, Martin Luther King, as you know, was in his twenties at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott. And uh, so, so there was a lot of focus on social justice and political activism among young people. And then particularly the, the sources of information were fewer. And, um, and so there were more national movements that coalesced around people like Martin Luther King and maintained themselves for many, many years. Uh, so that was one thing that was, was different. Another thing that was different than, well, I mean, similarity with young people, but different than, than now. And I think this was a hard one to uh, describe, but I, I, was, I was born in a time of segregation and then raised and educated with Jim Crow laws around me. We lived in the North, but the laws and the patterns of behavior were, were the same throughout my life through high school and into the time that I was in, in college. So I, we, we had a, so, so, this, so segregation, Jim Crow, its connections um, uh, to the 19th century and time when people were enslaved 
those things were there was a direct link uh, that was easy easy to see and the world that one lived in was different if depending on who you were and i i'm um struck by how um uh, ubiquitous th those rules and customs were how they were everywhere all the time uh every day so there's there's still a the, the all of the things we may talk about about racism and 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 bigotry and and intolerance and all the things that still exist in our society but it was in those days more in your face as the normal law the way that people behaved and the opportunity to engage in in policy at the levels that that people are able to gauge in um and, uh, in the in policy these days that was not even that that was not sort of un, unfathomable that was uh, science fiction so uh so there have been so now there's at least a pathway from most people to positions of influence or the concept that you know you 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 could be the president of the united states or something like that in those days that would it, would, it was like living on mars i mean just not like science fiction so i think that i hope that um, as we are thinking about the future we can look to the past and see that as slow and painstaking as it may be that step by step there is real change that a person like kamala harris can actually be uh, sworn in as the vice president and um and, and on and on and on I many so many other things that have happened so there i'm not that's that's my kind of thinking about then and thinking about now you can see things changing however slowly and maybe imperfectly but you can see things changing and moving and i hope that that gives people optimism for the future thank you i really am grateful that you're able to share that perspective with us it's so important um one of the things i i learned about you as i was preparing um for this conversation was that um you have a real love for music and that one of the big components of the class that you taught was about the intersection between music and the fight for social justice. And I was wondering if you would be willing to share some songs that you might put on if you were making a playlist, you know, for today's civil rights movement. What what are some of the of the of the things that you put on your mix? Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, and I'm uh, uh, I the, the 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 course that we taught was called um the uh, the supreme court civil rights and the music of the civil rights era so that was the that's what the course actually was the course has a, a a playlist and and the playlist and the music is meant to reflect the fact that so that so art art doesn't just come from the sky but it reflects the political and the social and the personal circumstances of the artist and so why did somebody write a song or behave or perform it in a certain way and we try to use songs through that era to reflect how people were feeling and acting to get in touch with the human lived experience of the times so it's not just pages in a book that we're we're reading so that's the the, the music part of it so maybe what i'll do is say a word about a couple of the songs that were most impactful in the 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 course um and and i mean and the students listen to so the one that that comes out of um um uh, that came out of the course. We, we had about 50 songs the first time we did it when it was just a musicology course, then we shrunk it down to about 17. And uh, Sam Cooke's A Change Is Gonna Come um, really is the, a song that I think struck the theme of the times as much as anyone. And when I would ask students at the end of the time and which songs meant a lot to them, um, that one showed up a lot as, as one that really um, uh, meant a lot. And there's a there's not a movie out now, a Night in Miami, um, which uh, I happen to see, and so and uh, the, you know Leslie Odom Jr. plays Sam Cooke, so it's nice to see Sam Cooke coming back, you know. And and they actually re reference a piece of the course that, or that that's that that's that's a, a delusions of grandeur. They reference um, an <clears throat> an artistic uh, connection that Sam Cooke had with Bob Dylan that we feature in the course as well how um a change is going to come was inspired by blowing in the wind by by bob dylan so um so i think a change is going to come is one of the songs that i would uh i think it's a beautiful rendition and captures the time i think also aretha franklin's um respect uh, uh 
really captures part of the time. It's a little later in the era and later in the course. <clears throat> and it's the Aretha Franklin version of the Otis Redding song. And the fact that he sang it and wrote it in one way, but she took it over and it had so much to do with the emergence of the women's movement. And, um, uh, and so that was, that was another song I think that captured very much the thing that we were trying to uh, discuss. There's, a, there's another song that I, I'd mentioned uh, that's, I, that's I find uh, fascinating. It, uh, it's called A Pawn in Their Game, A Pawn in Their Game. It's a Bob Dylan song from 1962 that he sang at the, in, in August of 63, at the time of the March, um, the Martin Luther King and the, and the March on Washington. And it's an interesting song also that kind of talks about the behavior of those who are not the leaders of resistance or of movements or of the, the, the oppositional forces, but people who kind of go along with things that are not moving in the right direction and try to therefore absolve themselves of any uh, guilt for their actions. And I think that's a very touching song and so interesting to listen to something written again, you know, 60 years ago, and then again and again and again, the words resonate. So those are, those are a few that uh, 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 were songs that we, we focused on the course. I know I'm, I'm feeling inspired that maybe we need to make like a speech spotlight live, you know, playlist or something like that. So um, I don't know all of those songs. So I'm going to go back and, 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 and listen. And then also uh, a night in Miami is, is on my list of things to see. Right. Um, so, you know, obviously music is one way that students and others can express themselves. Um, one of many ways. And, you know, you've spent your life um, in public research universities. And I'm wondering if you could, talk a little bit about how you view the university's role in training future leaders to use their voices, you know, engage in debate and inquiry. Yeah, I think our universities largely are, uh, uh, there's um, set up to uh, bring people together uh, and our residential universities um, in particular. And so I mentioned the kind of life that I grew up living that was so common in the United States that our communities were segregated. And, and even when there weren't rigid written rules, although there often were, still culturally people were segregated. There was this neighborhood and that neighborhood and that's where you, that's where you were. And uh, one of the things that universities have done is uh, uh, taken people and brought them to campus. And so we have more diversity in our universities than would exist in our communities normally, even these days. And then with, because we have residential universities, people live together. You don't, you know, people from different backgrounds can go to an event, but then you go home at, at night or you go to work in the same workplace, but then go home to your separate neighborhoods at night. Universities, we come together and then students in particular stay there. And so that, that this is an unusual thing in the world that people from so many different backgrounds come and then live, live together. And so we have a chance to practice what it's like living with people from different, who have different points of view, think of the world, see the world differently, have a different lived experience. And I'd, I'd say that largely that's not, not, not so much the case in human history. You know, people tend to, you, you get together with your, your band, with your, your community, with your, your tribe, your, your nation. And, and that's so that you're that group and then the other people are the other group. Now we have people from the different groups coming and actually living together in this, in this unusual circumstance. So we have to practice and learn how to live and grow uh, with people who don't have our same traditions. And so I think that there's important values that we need to practice in doing that. And uh, one is the value of respect for other people. and. I actually have these etched in a bowl in my office. Uh, 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 so one is respect, and that is that we treat other people with respect, and we treat ourselves with respect as well. We deserve to be treated with respect. And that's, I think, an important part of this working together. I think intellectual curiosity is really important. The university is that the pro our main product is knowledge. Uh, so we either uh, convey knowledge through teaching or intellectual discovery, or we create new knowledge through research. I mean, but that's our kind of our coin of the realm is, is knowledge. And so the, I, I think we need to be a place that celebrates the learning of things and the teaching of things and the sharing of ideas. So I think that intellectual curiosity is something that's very, very important to us. 
I'm, I'm a great believer in integrity. I think that we have to speak the truth. We have to seek the truth and we have to speak the truth. We have to be uh, uh, trusted to uh, be uh, clear and honest. I think that's very, very important. If the truth doesn't matter, then uh, you know uh, uh, our, our system doesn't work very well. So I believe in that very much. I believe in commitment that we, the things that we care about are worth caring about and, and worth leaning into and being, and being engaged. I believe also in, in empathy, and that is to understand that uh, we, we want to think of the people who are around us um, and, and care about them as people. As we appreciate, and I use appreciation for this, appreciate the fact that they come from different traditions uh, uh, than, than we come from. So they may think something different for reasons that make perfect, don't make any sense to us whatsoever until we understand what their lived experience is and say, oh, gosh, I can see why, whether or not I agree with that, I can see why someone might feel that way. I think that, that, that helps a lot. And finally, a value I think for our universities and something that I want us to practice is, is fun. Uh, you know, we, this is our, these are our lives and we don't get to, you can't have a do-over of yesterday, you know, so we really want to try to be, be here, appreciate what we have uh, to enjoy uh, those things um, that we have and, and, and to be engaged in our lives. And then the concept is that you do all those, you don't do one or two or three of those, you do them all at the same time. So you're respectful and honest and intellectually curious and trustworthy and all of those things and, and then engaged with your community so you can be a living and learning community uh, together. So I, I, that's what I have loved about being a part of universities for, for this my career here. And uh, what I look forward to, I will say one more thing which is that we're not the, I, I see us as the place for ideas. I don't, we're not the, we don't own the ideas. You know, it's not, it, it, we're really a place for people to come and, and share those ideas. So we're um, the sort of the marketplace of ideas we speak of. I, I, I believe in that as well, that, that I, certainly I don't know all the answers, but I think no one of us does. And uh, having us come together is, is uh, the way that we learn, learn more. That's beautiful. I mean, empathy, respect, intellectual curiosity, integrity, truth, trustworthiness, and fun. It's so nice that you added fun in there. I feel like 2020 was pretty devoid of fun. So I hope we can bring that back. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me, I, I think it's a very unfortunate narrative that has emerged in recent years where it talks about how you can either be sort of supporting free speech on campus or you can support you know, safe and inclusive campuses, that it's sort of an either or a proposition. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and maybe talk about some of the ways that you feel like you see balances the values of expression, you know, on campus with the need to ensure a safe environment for all members of the campus community. Yeah, so boy, a lot in, in that. So first, safety is incredibly important to us. And, um, uh, so we think a lot about that. I always feel very, it's, uh, you know, a medical doctor in my kind of, when I spoke about appreciation, like appreciation for the way that people approach things. So if you were looking at me, a part of it is that my, I really began my career as a medical doctor. So I, uh, I think a lot about people being healthy and safe. And uh, it's, it's a, a, just a core um, a value for me. So we want this to be a healthy, safe place for people and, and, care about that. And I care about that down to the individual. I, I, um, uh, I care about that to the, every individual who's a part of our community. I feel a responsibility to help um, uh, ma maintain and protect that person's safety. I will say, though, that being safe and being comfortable are not the same thing. And we have, um, when we have people coming from different points of view, there are many ideas that are, that one or another of us might find uncomfortable. And, um, and so we, we, we can't say that we're gonna make it that you agree with everything you hear or that you like everybody you, you meet or that everybody you, that says anything to or near you is going to be correct in, in that thing or it's going to be beautiful. The, the, the range of ideas in the world is much broader than, than that. So we um, <clears throat> want people to be um, uh, physically safe and appropriately uh, safe in their, uh, in their person. But we also know that many ideas are uncomfortable ideas or difficult dialogues that, that are, they are, are challenging things we have to deal with. I mentioned my own values, respect. And so I think as we can use respect in the way that we deal with people, 
that we can help uh, these uh, un uncomfortable dialogues to be less uh, threatening. Um, uh, but I, I can't manage everyone all the time. And uh, uh, so that's, that's a goal that we have rather than something we can uh, uh, define as, as being uh, necessary. Clark Kerr, you know, many years ago, uh, has a quote that um, sometimes on the, the cover of his uh, book, The Uses of the University, that says that it's, it's not our job to make speech safe for students. It's, uh, it's our job to make students safe for speech. That was the way he described this uh, back in the 1960s. And that is um, that we are, are able to deal in, in conversations with people who don't necessarily agree with us without them having to be bad people or without saying, I can't even uh, entertain that thought. So that's the, the balance that we, we have. We, <clears throat> uh, that's the balance that we have there. It, it, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that's the balance that we have to try to uh, create that space, have the dialogues, understand that it won't always be beautiful or we won't always agree with it and, and then be able to work with that or to, uh, yeah, to work with that, I think is the best that I can. No, yeah, sure. I think I think that's great. I, I think this idea of safe versus comfortable is a really important distinction. Um, I'm going to go ahead to uh, one of the questions um, in the queue, and I'm going to encourage all participants, if you would like to ask President Drake a question, please go ahead. Um, someone is asking about how the university continues to engage and partner with Congress in the face of the extreme political divide, um, you know, finding common ground to advocate for university priorities like access and diversity and research. That's a great, uh, great question. I, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, you've mentioned my uh, these different places I've been and things I've done. And part of it has been to be in the state legislature here and, and in Ohio, but also to be in, in Washington um, dozens and dozens of times. I've met with hundreds of members over these these years. And, uh, it, it, and you didn't mention this, but part of my work, uh, I've been worked with higher education organizations like AAU and APLU. And so we would be there uh, purposefully advocating for uh, different parts of our enterprise. And I would say that using the values that I mentioned earlier and thinking about the person that we were going to talk to and thinking about the principles and the, and the, the issue that we were carrying forward, we would engage in those conversations with them over and over and over in a respectful way and look for ways to gain support from those who agreed with this or to, uh, uh, um, move and uh, and educate those who didn't agree with us. And I spent time with the most liberal members of Congress. I spent time with members of the Freedom Caucus, leaders of the Freedom Caucus. And we would, my own way really was to try to find that place where we had some common ground and then to work forward um, as much as we could from there. Ar Arthur Ashe, the tennis player, uh, uh, and and uh, I, I think social activists, uh, particularly later in his career, um, AIDS activists and, and civil rights activists in so many ways. But um, Arthur Ashe had a line in his book that said, um, uh, start, where, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And I think that uh, that was a, a, a way to work together, particularly with people where you had very little in, in common. I'll say something else too about that, I, I, you know, the flowing thoughts. Uh, I found that I spent more time in Washington in particular with people I didn't agree with than with people I did agree with. The, the people I agreed with were great to talk with. I mean, I, you, they were great for support and you feel good and hug and whatever, but, but to change policy really meant getting people who were on the other side to move. And so I spent a lot of time working with those people. And actually, in many cases, we're able to get uh, things were different at the end of that. And I, I appreciated that. And it was uh, something to continue to work on. So I, I, I appreciate that. No, that's great. I think sometimes that's one of the challenges, especially in the work the center does, is how do we get people to engage with people outside of their bubbles and comfort zones. Um, you know, you spoke a lot, you've mentioned truth a couple times, and I, I, I'd like to kind of focus in on this, I, this time that we're in a time of misinformation and when trust in science um, skews differently, depending on political leanings. And um, we have a question in the queue talking about um, this truth being under attack. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about how this has impacted higher ed, especially a research institution like UC. 
Yes. Uh, well, you know what? The, we, as a research institution, we are really searching for refinements of the truth, and we so we search for evidence. We base things on evidence. In medicine, we have a thing called evidence-based medicine. I'm going to give you this medicine or do this treatment for this particular condition. Here's what's going to happen, and here's how I know it's going to happen, which I've done to, to show that it's going to happen. Right now, we are rolling out vaccines, which I, uh, in, in, uh, what how, how do I was with enthusiasm encourage everyone to get. Uh, but how do we know the vaccines work? What you, you know? What is this this thing? And so people went through all the science and then through human trials with tens of thousands of patients, saying. If we do this, we expect this to happen, in, and then we watch to see, and when that happens, we say, aha, we did A, we got result B as expected, we then uh, connect those two and use that evidence to uh, build our policy. So I'm a, I'm a believer in evidence, and, um, uh, and, and then for evidence, you have to have facts, and the, ha the facts have to be as clear as, as they can be. And, and, you know, we, we, we like to say you, you have a right to your opinion, but not to your own facts. And I think that's very, very important. Let me say something about facts, though. And, and um, I don't want to say this in the wrong way. So I want to make sure I say this in, in, the, in the right way. So first, I think it's really important and something that seeking the truth and seeking facts and building things on evidence is, is the, 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 the best for all of us in, in our rational world. And so I'm a, a believer there. What I must say, I, I, I was at a uh, at a retreat once, uh, kind of a team building retreat with my, my uh, colleagues. And one of the exercises that we did was that the, the leader of it, uh, the facilitator flashed a picture up on the, the on, on a screen and it was a montage of maybe 50 different images. There would be a, a traffic light, uh, uh, a, a, a bicycle, a duck, uh, a lake, a mountain, a whole, all these different things, just images kind of randomly posted together in, in a collage um, uh, montage. And he flashed it up and there were maybe 15 of us there. And it flashed up on the screen and it was there for two seconds, maybe three seconds, and it was down. And then he got a piece of paper and he, and he said, okay, write down everything you saw. And so we all would sit down and write down what we saw. I saw. Donald Duck, I saw the stoplight, I saw the Eiffel Tower, you know, whatever it was, he'd write those things down. And then after a minute or so, he said, okay, stop and went to the first person. And she would read the five or six or seven things that she could remember having seen from the montage. And what I noticed myself listening was, well, a couple of those things I had seen, but other ones I, I hadn't seen that. I didn't uh, realize there was a locomotive there. I just didn't see it. And then he'd go to the next person and they'd, write, they'd say what they saw and what they saw and whatever. And what you learned is that nobody saw exactly the same thing. Everybody saw some little different things. And um, some, many people might have seen a few, uh, several things, but some people saw something that no one else saw up there on the, the board. And when we and, and also no one, if there were 50 things, no one could remember more than seven or eight or nine of them. But when we went across and had the entire group together, pretty much everything had been seen. And so we kind of learned that looking at the same things in the same place at the same time, we see different things. Um, and that none of us see all of it, but all of us together see more than any one of us does. And um, so I think I think that's part of our, our uh, the power of us working together as well as so we all bring something to this um, uh, uh, to this discussion, to the narrative, uh, to the growth as a people, as a as individuals, as a people, as a as a country, and that that's that's really where the power is. Ground rules, but though, and I, what I just said is that everybody who said they saw something, those things were actually there. It wasn't, you know, you couldn't just make up things in reality, so. Um, no, I, I, I like that illustration. It could be a really interesting exercise to use in facilitations that we do about speech and expression and perspectives and lenses. Um, we have a couple other interesting questions in the queue. Um, one is asking you if you have thoughts on how universities can train professors to engage in these uncomfortable discussions. Um, in ways that ensure that students are physically safe, but also willing to engage with peers who think um, and look differently at the world. 
Yes, you know, we, uh, uh, and there are these places that exist. We had a, an Institute for Teaching and Learning that we um, uh, set up in my last uh, posting. And part of its, and this was like a professional development for teachers, mainly for professors. And part of it was the, to help professors get better at recognizing and supporting the different uh, perspectives and points of view that students brought to the class. To not think, well, here's what a student is and what a student thinks, and therefore, this is the way I can present the material and that's fine. To understand that uh, students had multiple, had different life experiences that they brought uh, to, to the discussion and to be sensitive to that in the presentation of the information. Now we, and so I think that can be taught and learned and practiced and it's something that we need to uh, continually work uh, to, to support that when we need to understand and respect the diversity of opinions that people bring and to do our best to um, allow ourselves to receive those different perspectives without reacting in ways that tends to, to shut them down. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, we're gonna cover some broad topics, but related is about Prop 209 um, and how that continues to have a chilling effect. And the question is, how do you see it today as an issue that interferes with um, inclusiveness at UC? Yeah, so you know, uh, Prop 209, I, I was uh, part of, uh, I was an admissions director in the 90s. And so I had a chance to, uh, uh, well, if I could say, um, uh, my first interaction with the regents was really to talk about our admissions programs and how well they worked. And the, the person on the other side was one of the regents who was the one who was the author of Prop 209. I mean, that, that was my specific person to talk with. And, um, and, and SP 1 and 2 were the two regents policies that preceded Prop 209, but they really narrowed the uh, number of, of uh, uh, methods that we could use to help uh, improve diversity and required uh, quite a bit of work on, on, on our part. The things I want to say, maybe there are three things. First, um, we would look at, always look forward to policies being um, uh, policies that would facilitate our increasing inclusiveness and diversity in, in, our, in our campuses. So we, we always would support those and, and continue to support them. Two, in the interim, this is now 25 years roughly, in the interim, we've uh, done lots of things to enhance um, access and inclusiveness um, in uh, the absence of uh, uh, affirmative action. And, and those things have worked and I think are robust and continue to, to move forward. No one of these solutions is perfect. And in fact, this is a, a solution to a problem rather than a cure of the, of the problem. And the problem is bigotry and, and racism and that, that's the, Thing we'd like to root out. These are ways that we deal with it rather than 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 eliminate it. But we have other things that we've used. So we this last fall admitted the most diverse class in our history, which is uh, so we it's not you know our hands haven't been tied uh, firmly. So we we are able to continue to, to uh, in, increase our diversity and actually we have an increase in uh, Latino and African American applicants for next year's class over this last year's class. So we. Are, are continuing with our, our quest to be the uh, as broadly accessible as, as possible. Uh, uh, but the, the policies of uh, different agencies of government, et cetera, can in fact narrow our, our, uh, our ability to be successful. I, but I'm gonna give, give an example of something. This is to be a little more thoughtful, to be a little trusting of the audience that, that I can be thoughtful without them jumping to the conclusions. I'm gonna be a little trusting. So I had, when I came for the discussion about why our admissions program was so important to the health and safety of our communities, to the quality of our education, to the quality of science that we were doing, all those things abundantly true. The regents at the time, nevertheless, had a different policy um, uh, aim in mind and they voted, they didn't care about that. They voted for um, uh, their SB1 and 2, nevertheless. So I was quite uh, disappointed, but then we worked on we still had the same policy goals and we still had the same aims. We wanted to be the best educational institution we could be. We wanted to train the best doctors. This, I was at a medical school, so we wanted to train the best doctors we could, and we kept working on that. Uh, I will say that we then developed programs, and one of the programs that we developed was a thing called a PRIME program. PRIME stands for Programs in Medical Education, meant to help give people who are interested in caring for underserved populations 
more training and support on how to do that effectively. I could speak for hours about it, I won't, but it's just to say, gosh, a medical doctor who's interested in serving this particular community primarily, we have extra training and support to make it that they're able to in fact do that. And it's, it's been going on now for 15 years and I'm very proud of it going to expand it this next year um, to be more, even more uh, inclusive. So I'm very pleased about that. What I wanna say is that one of the people who helped me develop the policy was the person who uh, was on the other side of, the, of the, the 209 debate. Because what it seemed to me is that if I were going to have a policy that was going to increase diversity and be a lasting sustainable program and grow into the future, I had to make sure that I'd worked it well, that working through people who would be antagonists to that and getting something that would be successful even despite their antagonism or could get their support and achieve the ends we were interested in would be an important thing to do. And so, um, so those conversations were very important in tuning the program that we put forward and that still exists and is expanding even today. So tying back to what I'd said a little bit earlier. No, you're, the longevity that you have in watching change and it sounds like we're still, we're moving slowly, but still moving in, in the right direction. Um, I want to uh, take a little bit of a turn and, and, and you kind of can't have a discussion today without talking about the just recent presidential election. And, you know, I really want to acknowledge that UC made tremendous efforts to get the vote out this fall. And um, I think the question is, what is the system going to do to capitalize on the momentum of that successful campaign and, and beyond voting, what else do you think higher education should be doing to foster a culture of civic engagement? Let me focus on the voting piece first. Uh, and just say it's great, this election had a record youth voter turnout. So that was uh, extraordinarily important. We saw the impact of voter registration and really just making sure that people get a chance to uh, ex express their opinions and who they are and I think one of the the, the, uh, the great examples of that was Georgia, where there have been people who've been Georgians for years and just hadn't voted. And when you said, gosh, what do, who are Georgians and what do they actually feel? What do they, who, who do they want to represent them? There were changes that was, would have been seen as um, uh, fanciful. Um, uh, at any, honestly, any time in, the, <laughs> the, the, in our history to today. So, so, so change can happen. It takes everyone uh, leaning in and I'm not, this is not saying what, what way people should vote or anything else. It's just that, that people should vote. And when people vote, then you, then we're all represented better. And that every, every voter, every person, every engaged person matters is the, is, is the, the first thing. So I think that's very, very, very important. Uh, each, each of us matters. Second, I was very, very pleased and proud of our students, honestly, over these um, years. I've seen this in prior years as well, honestly, even back to the time of, um, you know, those decades ago during the civil rights movement, students were very active in registering others to vote, in talking about the importance of voting and, and voting themselves. And, and I think our students today feel and practice this even more strongly than uh, was done in many cases in the past. And I, so I'm, I'm proud of that. And then something that we, we do, we've worked on a lot on our campuses is have a variety of forums in which people can come to discuss and debate different issues and i think all of those things that 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 uh, practice and foster civic engagement i, mean, I mentioned um, uh, passion and commitment and integrity uh, among my values that if you can use those things if you can lean in and be engaged uh, that allows you to learn that allows the world to develop in ways that that you see as as positive my final point on that will be at uh, gallup did a study years ago looking at alumni and a whole variety of things about alumni. And one thing they looked at was people who were happy at work and making a difference in their community. And one of the things they found that really correlated with happiness and healthiness and all a whole series of things that were, were positive, were the, the, the factor was how engaged was that person in his or her job. And people who were very engaged in their job, engaged in their profession, engaged in their lives, were happier, more productive, got more done, et cetera. And when they found what, what predict, what things in a, a collegiate career and a collegiate training career predicted engagement in one's professional life or work life later on, it was engagement in college. So what it means to be engaged, to be a part of it, to be doing things, that um, whatever that is, that since, um, uh, tends to continue on into one's professional life 
and to be a marker of, of uh, success and, and happiness and impact. So I, I, I'm, I'm always uh, very pleased when our students are engaged. Okay, and we have a wonder, UC has a wonderful legacy of that. Um, another interesting question coming in um, in the queue actually has to do with the staff of the university. And as public employees, how can they help to drive some of the challenging conversations around institutional racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion within their own roles at the university? Well, I love, I love it. I, and, um, you know, we don't have, don't have time to say everything, but let me say what I'm saying for students applies for staff and, and applies for faculty and really for citizens broadly. So we encourage very much having our uh, members of our employee group, our staff be engaged on campus and in their communities broadly. We, I work actively with uh, members of staff. I met with our um, staff advisors to the region just last night and uh, we had an active uh, engaged hour long conversation and I really do appreciate that. I. I don't know if I'm going to say it's in the wrong way, but I was very in, in, in engaged with the staff at my prior institution. They, they nicely named something for me when I left. It was very touching. And um, it, they believe, I believe, that uh, work is a place to go to be engaged and to, you, you know, the, the uh, thing that, uh, that Man Gorman mentioned last week about making the, um, uh, our country not being so broken, but it, it's, uh, it's just not finished. I think our university is that way. It's, it's just, you know, we're every day trying to make it a little bit better and, and never quite finished. And, I, and the staff are a critical, a critical part of that. And uh, we hope that this is a place where they can feel engaged, engaged in staff organizations, engaged in the discussions and debates that we have on, on campus, uh, engaged in all that we do. No, that's really important. Everybody has a role to play. Um, I firmly believe that also. So, I mean, it's hard to believe that we're almost coming to the end of our time. So I want to um, kind of get more of a 50,000 foot view with our last couple questions. And one of them is what do you anticipate will be some long term impacts of the pandemic on teaching and learning? What we found with the pandemic is a couple of things. One is that uh, although not perfect and not what we would uh, wish that we could do more virtually than we had imagined and when we as we're doing with medicine where we are going we we went to a very few in-person outpatient visits last spring and a very great number of telemedicine visits as the summer rolled on and we were able to do more uh, traditional um, in-person visits we reduced the number of telemedicine visits, but not nearly down to where they were before. So now we're seeing more patients today than we were a year ago today because we have our in-person visits and then tens of thousands of telemedicine visits every week across our, our system. So we've learned how to use technology to expand our reach and uh, expand our connection with people. And I, I'm sure that that will be the case for our educational offerings going forward. I still believe that universities like ours will have our predominant method of, of educating and learning and growing um, and interacting will be in-person residential education like, like we've done um, uh, uh, for all of these years. But I believe that the uh, virtual and uh, technology enhanced fraction of our course offerings will be larger. And that I, I hope, and I've actually, we were seeing this happen before, sh should tend to facilitate the, the pathway of our students through the, uh, the maze of getting their degrees. So I, I think that, we'll, that education will be different, will be changed, um, and will incorporate more technology as we, as we move forward. Okay. And then, you know, now thinking about sort of the new administration and, um, you know, if you could, you know, talk about some changes you hope the Biden administration will make with regard to higher education, um, what would be your, you know, your couple of your top ones? Well, great. I've, you know, I've worked, as I mentioned, with, with several administrations. And so the not to be, I don't want to point, but the last administration was different than the others, regardless of party. Uh, our engagement was always, it was easier with the prior administrations, no matter who they were. And we found it easier to find common ground. And I would say that one of the things that was a challenge for us is that, that we would come in as uh, where respect for the truth and for verifiable data and science, all those things were the foundation upon which many of our policies were built. And, and when those were challenged, it, the discussions were uh, moved more, more slowly. And again, I don't, uh, this is not everybody, certainly, and, and I don't mean to 
uh, uh, paid anyone into a particular corner, but we found more of a challenge the last uh, four years than we had um, uh, before, or even in the last two weeks. I mean, it's been better in, in the last two weeks. Um, you know, we what we would say about the administration in, in, uh, in particular is that the uh, first lady uh, is a professor at community college. And so a person with an advanced degree who teaches and believes in that and has continued that as her, her career. So I think that the understanding of the importance of that is something that's clear um, in that household. The vice president is an alumna of UC Hastings, Howard for undergraduate, but UC Hastings for uh, um, her, her law degree. And so um, the, the importance and the power of the University of California in preparing people for their careers is something that is a lived experience there. So those things help us a lot in, you know, we don't have to begin at square one, um, justifying our existence or explaining why, what, what we do. I think it's nice to have uh, people who've worked with us uh, in those positions of power. And, and again, that it spreads much beyond the executive branch to other places. We, we are actively engaged. We, we're engaged with the transition team and we uh, certainly in, expect to be actively engaged in, in the future. Okay, so um, I cannot believe, I guess they say time flies when you're having fun and um, this has been very illuminating. And I, um, I think in the last question is sort of, you know, you've lived through so much, you've been at so many different institutions. This is a very unique time. Um, I just don't know if you have any thoughts for participants about, you know, self care and sort of keeping mentally healthy among amid this kind of chaos and kind of any words to live by before we close. Well, oh gosh, thank you. And uh, a few things. First, this is an extraordinarily challenging time for everybody. It's, you know, we've not lived through anything like this where it affected everyone's life in some way. Some lives have been lost, families devastated, businesses lost. So it's been horrific um, and devastating for uh, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens, uh, extended uh, even beyond that whole community. So that's, that's been awful. But even where it hasn't been so awful, it's changed daily life. I'm sitting in a room by myself where I sit you know, routinely. And uh, so even our most normal things are done in a completely different way than they were done in, in the past. And um, so it really is affecting all of us, I think. And, and, and so first, it's appropriate to feel normal. It's because it isn't normal. The second. So first, it's a nation program just in December and the things that are better in if every inning, you know, it's the first or second inning um, of this, but uh, the, thus far, although it's slower than we wish, um, the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine programs have uh, looked to uh, mirror in the public what we saw in the trials. So I was very encouraged with the data we, we had uh, yesterday. Um, uh, third, I'd say that uh, exercise is a critical. You know, we need to all do what we can, where we can to do whatever exercise we can. Yeah. You're cutting out a little bit, but. And, and, and I think that that's um, uh, an uh, as high as we can, and I, I encourage that. And, and uh, something that we want to do. And then to know that it is each I'm being told that there are some storms in the Bay Area and that is probably impacting internet. Um, so um, I don't know that we're gonna get to hear the final um, words, but um, from President Drake, while we're waiting to I see- I think I'm yes. hear oh. you again. Oh, there you are. I was just saying that there was some storms in the Bay and I didn't know if we were gonna get to hear your final words. I don't know yes. if you wanna finish up. I think we were on exercise and- um, Yes. I was showing that I, that I believe exercise is important and then the, the, screen, the screen froze. So I just think exercise is important. Last thing I want to say is that 
there really are data showing that it's getting better. And we just have to stay, stay focused. Uh, you know, every month it should get better. Every week it should get better. So we're, I'm um, hopeful that we'll all continue to work together and get there uh, by the springtime. Again, it takes all of us, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we're moving in the right direction finally. Well, I'm always pleased to end any kind of webinar on a hopeful note. I am incredibly grateful to you, not just for taking the time, but being so candid and thoughtful, um, you know, and talking about this historic moment for higher education and democracy. Um, for the participants on the call, it's um, a busy and exciting time for the center right now. Our voice funding applications for UC students, staff and faculty are due tomorrow, fr Friday, February 29th. So don't miss out. Um, our applications for our National Fellows Program, you do not need to be part of UC, you can be from anywhere, are also now open and please visit our website for more information. Our next Speech Spotlight Live, though this is going to be a hard one to follow, um, will take place on February 23rd. It's going to be on Is Deplatforming the Answer? It's going to feature um, Genevieve Lockyer from University of Chicago and Ben Wisner, Director of ACLU's Project on Speech, Privacy and Technology. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, I just wanna tell everyone, I hope you stay healthy um, and we'll just try to stay hopeful. Thank you again. Thank you.